morning and happy Friday, everybody. Thank you for joining me today for another episode of The Seamless Connection. Today, I'm thrilled to have Ann Mon Johnson with me, the CEO of the American Telemedicine Association. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Ann to introduce herself and her background with both the ATA as well as her kind of startup experience, which has brought a lot to the table, especially for founders like me. Um, and then I'm going to dive into some, some very cool questions with her. Ann. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mina. It is great to be on with you. And let me just say that what you're doing at Amplify is very exciting for all of us because it really embodies what we believe telehealth and technology-enabled care to be all about. So as you said, I'm the CEO of the ATA. I've been with the organization for five years, just over five years. And I came to it by a series of startups, all in healthcare and uh, the last three working with healthcare data in conjunction with decision support tools and digital mobile apps to help consumers navigate the healthcare system. So I've been a big proponent of consumerism in healthcare. And I guess that would really drive a lot of what I brought to the ATA because I saw telehealth as a natural extension and expression of consumerism in healthcare. So it's really been an honor and a privilege to lead the organization. No, it's fantastic. I know you guys are coming up on your 30 year anniversary or it's this year. I don't know exactly which yep. month, but um, for those in the audience that might not be familiar, can you remind us what the goal of the ATA is and what your kind of driving mission is? So the goal of the organization, which represents over 400 organizations, delivery systems, payers, physician groups, and then a range of solution providers. Um, and these are organizations that either deliver telehealth or enable the delivery of telehealth. And, and let me just say from the onset that we define telehealth pretty broadly. It's more than what we're doing right now with the video. It's really asynchronous communication. It's remote monitoring. It's everything that makes those things possible, including AI. So we have a pretty broad agenda and it's reflected in the broad broad diversity of our membership as well. And we're really here to ensure that telehealth is accepted as a modality of care, that it's not um, viewed or treated or uh, regarded as a different type of medicine. It really becomes an arrow in the quiver of clinicians and consumers that's made available to them to make sure that all Americans get care where and when they need it. And that when they do, they know it's safe, effective and appropriate. Well, that's fantastic and music to my ears. Um, you came on at the ATA right before COVID. You had two years to kind of get your feet wet, and then all of a sudden you were slammed with a whole lot. I know from personal experience, you guys were at the forefront of a lot of the um, kind of advocacy for getting telehealth opened up in the middle of the pandemic to get care when people were pretty much homebound or hospitals were pretty much in shutdown and lockdown. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what was the availability and access to telehealth and, and to remote care really before COVID and what were you guys able to help advocate for change to open it up more during COVID? And then we can talk a little bit after that about where we are. Sure, today. sure. So I would say that prior to the pandemic, the, um, the real issues were that there were a lot of regulations and limitations that were put in place in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. And that was before the iPhone came out. So you can imagine the disconnect between technology, what it can do, and what was what were the type of restrictions. So, for example, um, there were in-person requirements that were put in place. There was the notion of originating site that people had to be in a specific location in order to receive the care. And again, you think about this, it's not very consistent with how we conduct our business. So what the pandemic did for good or for bad, was really open up the possibility to what technology and what telehealth in particular has always been able to deliver, which is really to ensure that people can have access to care, even if they can't go face to face or in person with a clinician. And we found that there was enormous acceptance of it because as people scrambled to figure out how to stay safe, they really relied on these new modalities to access you know, what do I do if I think I have COVID? Can I order an at-home test to make sure I don't have it? And, and those sorts of things. And um, fortunately, what we found was that there was a lot of not only positive interaction with the um, different types of telehealth that are available, but there's a huge bipartisan support for it as well, because politicians, regulators, legislators, uh, 
regulators and legislators, easy for me to say, um, really understood that historically we've had issues of access. And you know from your own work that there were not nearly enough specialists to take care of all the healthcare needs of all Americans, especially as they grow older and oftentimes are not in great health. So we saw a real surge in the use and um, really there were a lot of waivers that were put in place and that was really what we promoted primarily at the federal level to ensure that these things were put in place to allow for the broad use of telehealth. Unfortunately, a lot of these waivers have been extended through the end of 2024, which you know, I, everyone in the industry was so thankful for. Um, there were some that weren't, though, for example, controlled substances that's still up for review and finalization this year. Yeah. And even for the waivers, when they sunset, there's no necessarily a guarantee that we won't go back to geographic restrictions and right. restrictions and all of that. Um, what can we as consumers or we as healthcare entities or we as ATA members do to ensure that the now broader access of healthcare, right? It's hard to put a teeny back in a bottle, but yeah. they're going to try. <laughs> so yeah. how, how do we ensure that they can't and don't, and they understand the importance of what it is? Have there been studies that you have seen maybe that, you know, I have anecdotal evidence, of course, from day to day, but have there been broad-based studies that you're aware of that you guys have commissioned perhaps even to show um, what has been the positive impact of telemedicine through the pandemic and can, can you know, continue? Well, I think a couple of things. One is that there has been enormous numbers of studies that have been released in the last year or so following this three-year exper experiment called the pandemic. And what we found is a couple of things. If you'll recall, prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of myths or perceptions that somehow telehealth wasn't the same as in-person, as if in-person care was the gold standard. And again, we know that um, you can't reach everyone if you don't use technology-enabled care to make that happen. And so um, these studies that have come out, they've come out from Mayo, they've come out from a number of organizations that have really honed in on the issue of, is it different? Is it as good as? Is, is it, in some instances, even better? And consistently what we've found, and, and we're not blind to all the studies coming out yet. I mean, there's still more to be published, but What's really remarkable is that in an environment where there's concerns about fraud, waste, and abuse, um, that hasn't been the case with telehealth. In the concerns about somehow it's different than in-person, as if in-person is a gold standard, that hasn't been the case. Um, and those are the types of studies that we continue to showcase and get out to the public so that you as a member and the community at large can say, wait a second, this is not correct. And so we have an enormously effective policy team led by Kyle Zeppeli. We also launched ATA uh, Action, which is our 501c6. It's an affiliated trade organization that's focused exclusively on advocacy. So it is a thoughtful and deliberate effort that we're engaged in to make sure that these waivers become permanent, that the in-person requirements go away once and for all, and that we do make sure that we safeguard people who have enjoyed or appreciated the enormous benefits associated with having access to controlled substances during the pandemic, that that doesn't go away either, because we want to make sure that laws and regulations that are put in place are medically necessary and not just a uh, consideration that that might be a good thing. It may be well intended, but the consequences often are off base. So we are really working at the federal and state level to make sure that happens. No, that's great. And one thing you and I have talked about in the past is how telehealth has the potential to address disparities in healthcare access, including special care, whether you're rural, whether you're an urban you know, medical care desert, um, whether you you live or you're part of a community of color, all sorts of areas where we don't have the appropriate care, appropriate, appropriate access to care. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. And a couple of things. One is that the access to specialists in rural communities is essential, as you know. And we have seen so many great examples of how that's been done, organizations that have made that happen. And recognizing, again, that it's much more than video. It's asynchronous. It's, it's, it's remote monitoring. So those types of services and those modalities, I think, are really important. The second, though, is that we organized an advisory group on how telehealth could be used to eliminate disparities. 
And one output of that group was a framework that pointed to a number of levers or areas that could be addressed, the top of which, the tip of the iceberg being connectivity. And we did that very deliberately because we want people to know that even if you have access to broadband, even if you have incredible internet access, it's not enough. So you have to have the devices, you have to have affordable devices, you have to have affordable data plans. There's the issue of literacy, both for health and data literacy. And then there's the whole issue of trust, which unfortunately, um, both in rural communities as well as communities of color, we have not done a great job of. And so we can use technology and telehealth in particular to begin to address all of those by making sure that services are in communities and that we partner with groups that are trusted in the community. So we're doing things with people and not to them. And that's, that's been a theme that's come up in terms of building the trust to get the engagement, because there's a lot of things that in healthcare has been tried before. I'm sure you've seen a lot over your time as well, where people think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but if you don't have people have buy-in and have engagement, it can just sit there on the sidelines. Right. So how do you build that trust and that engagement, especially in areas that haven't had access before, and they potentially see it with a little bit of suspicion, maybe fear that it's going to displace something local? Um, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Well, there is a lot of innovation going on in that regard. So one of it is, you know, the whole issue of partnering with local trusted sources, churches, schools, um, neighborhood organizations that are really engaged in making sure that people are healthy. I uh, had a chance to speak with a cardiologist in Chicago uh, earlier this week who talked about an effort in the southwest, the south side of Chicago, um, where medical students were used to reach out to people at risk in the community. And it was viewed as a very trusted operation where there was huge uptake. So I think this appetite of people wanting to take care of themselves, if given the opportunity and working with sources that they really believe in, it does have momentum and it can be hugely successful. That's great. And it's just a matter of blending that with, with the virtual care options yes. to make sure it gets out to the number of people. Yes, right? exactly. Exactly. And you, you approach this whole, um, the, your work at the ATA and your work more broadly with, with uh, such a mission driven pursuit. What, you know, what is your personal connection to healthcare? What drew you to it from the beginning? So, as I mentioned, I had been in healthcare for my entire career working with data and it was always interesting to me that, um, not everybody was aware of what the data pointed to in terms of where might be the best facility to have certain types of procedures. And I guess the, the fun act anecdote associated with this was that I was skiing and I broke my shoulder. And after I went down the toboggan of shame, I had surgery. And following the surgery, I had virtual physical therapy. And I was absolutely blown away because it really protected me from going to the hospital to the physical therapy um, site itself when you don't want to be jostled on a bus because you have broken shoulder and it's inc incredibly uncomfortable. But the other, and this is all pre-ATA, it was just so easy and it was something that I could control. And again, when I talk about telehealth being consumerism in healthcare, that's part of it. And so when I got recruited to run the ATA, I was like, oh my God, I had a great experience. This is easy peasy. Who could object to this? And I was quickly disabused of that. So I well, see it. I yeah, well, I see it as really an opportunity to get things right. We have issues of access, of uneven care across the United States. And you can't solve for those without using technology to reimagine how care is delivered. And that's access to specialists, to primary care, to mental health um, uh, specialists. And that's really my personal driver is to make sure we get it right this time. Yeah, no, that, that's amazing. And I guess I, I want to drill down on that question. Like, who could object to this? Like, who do you see objecting to this? You would think, you know, after the pandemic, after all the benefits we saw, um, I still run across people that that have for one reason or another. So I'm curious to see who you run across and what what kind of the commonalities or the themes that they put forth are that are still holding us back today from maybe even a broader adoption? Well, I think sometimes people are just misinformed, right? And so you just have to get information in front of them and say, you know, that's an interesting point of view, but let's, let's, let's show you how that may not be correct. And let's, let's use information to change your mind. 
The second is because so many people used telehealth during the pandemic, both patients and providers, that that has really created a sea change. So when you hear people object to it, oftentimes it's because they have self-interests or they're just operating um, in a way that's not based on real experience or real insights that the data show. Mm -hmm. And speaking of data, you uh, you at the ATA have been doing a lot of data collection, and I know you're working on a big project that's coming out here in September. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, this is coming out of the advisory group that's using telehealth to eliminate disparities. And so the framework that I described previously that started with connectivity, what we now have coming out is a interactive map that's going to look at the digital infrastructure across the United States and then relate that back to what is the economic value add to a community if that digital infra infrastructure is repaired and really addressed. And I think that's really exciting because we talk a lot about ROI, which is sort of an exhausting concept and somehow telehealth is challenged by it, particularly in a fee-for-service environment. So we think changing the playing field, shifting it to really a discussion about economic value added is the way to go. That's fantastic. Do you have any early results that you can give us some little teasers about or not quite yet? Well, I would, but I would be spoiling the the fanfare associated with it. <laughs> I'll let you hold on to the secrets then. We'll bring it then. Um, I just wanted to close with a few thoughts from you on what you're most excited about personally as a healthcare consumer looking for maybe for the next year or so. Um, and then also on a professional front with what's what you're working on with the ATA. So personally, I'm incredibly excited and um, challenged by this opportunity and obligation we have. So I have a lot of energy around that. And um, it's really, it's an important endeavor. So that, that gives me a lot of drive for getting things done. I would say from our perspective, what I see in terms of innovation that's happening is one thing that is very exciting is the way that technology and particularly AI can be used to really address and mitigate the what I call the soul crushing work that clinicians have to bear. And I am excited about how that is being addressed and um, the idea that you're not shifting the pain to another person off the back of the clinician, but you're really shifting it onto technology. And that to me is very exciting. So I think we're going to see a lot more, um, certainly with the appropriate guardrails, but um, I do think that that is really going to be a sea change for us as well. That's fantastic. Well, it sounds like you've got some interesting initiatives and exciting initiatives ahead of you for the next year. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us this morning. Um, I want to be respectful of your time, but um, I am looking forward to hearing the results of the special group in September with that map you mentioned. Absolutely. And um, Absolutely. during Telehealth Awareness Week, September 17 through 25. That's right. Thank you so much for yeah. your time this morning, Ann. Perfect. Thank you, Mina. I appreciate it.